Tonight, our phrase that we're going to be looking at is the phrase, O day spring. And as we look at it, we want to remember anytime we gather together, anytime we study the Word of God, we're, especially as it relates to Advent, we're wanting to find out what the text actually says and determine what it means and then what it means for us. Now, because it's Advent, we remember what did it mean when Jesus came for the first time? What does it mean that Jesus is coming back at some point in history? And maybe very, very soon, but maybe not as soon as we think. And then also importantly, what does it mean in our lives? So I've got the Latin written up there for you. I noticed that it says, O Orens. And I thought about that. I thought, O Orens. Maybe I should have said Pastor Oyen to preach this because uh, it's almost his name, you know. O Oyens, Orens, something like that. Anyway, I don't know Latin. I don't know Latin at all. But the Latin word there that we say, O Orens, has within its meaning several ideas. Dawn, morning, morning star, and east. In fact, if you think about it, this word is where we get the word orient. And it's also where we get the word orientation. Now, much of the translation is actually translated day spring. And we're going to be reading it as day spring. What is a day spring? What is a day spring? A day spring is very clear. It is the place on the horizon where the sun rises. So when the one sun comes up in the morning, the place where the sun comes up is called a day spring. Now, if you live close to the equator, it doesn't move very often. But if you live in the far north or the far south, as far as you go in that direction, the place where the sun comes up moves back and forth over throughout the year. There are a number of famous uh, structures in our world, for instance, like Stonehenge, that is, is built in such a way so that on the shortest day of the year in the northern hemisphere, which is December 21, the day spring comes up in that spot. And so you can see that that's something that's quite familiar. Now, what does that have to do with the Word of God? What does that have to do with the book of Isaiah? What does it have to do with the Messiah? Well, let me read to you the English, the English translation of, of this particular uh, antiphon, and it goes like this. O day spring... Splendor of light eternal and son of righteousness, come and enlighten those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. In the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, there's a verse that relates to this particular, this particular uh, statement. As again, one time only, just before the end of 2019, never to be repeated, I will be singing for you. There, this is... This is uh, antiphon number five. There's two more after this. And I hope you'll, enjoy, you'll join me a little bit towards the end when we come to the, uh, the chorus. But when you sing it later in the service, you'll understand it better. Let me sing for you. Oh, come our day spring from on high And cheer us by your drawing nigh Disperse the gloomy clouds of night And death dark shadows put to flight Let's sing Rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel shall come to you O Israel Sing again Rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. That was great. You guys should make a choir, yeah? The reason I only sing by myself is not because I don't want to have other people competing with me. It's because I get to set the key, and I get to set the key way, way down there. You guys did really, really well. All right, would you stand to your feet? We're going to read this passage together. This is from the book of Isaiah. And this is a prophecy about the Messiah who is to come. It's, it's a little bit longer, and we're going to be reading the first uh, uh, seven or eight verses, and we're going to read from the message translation. And so this is quite valuable. So let's read together. There shall be no darkness for those who are in trouble. The earlier he did bring the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali into disrepute. But the time is coming when he'll make that whole area glorious. The road along the sea, the country past the Jordan, international Galilee. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. 
For those who lived in a land of deep shadows, light sunbursts of light, you repopulated the nation. You expanded its joy. Oh, they're so glad in your presence. Festival joy. The joy of a great celebration, sharing rich gifts and warm greetings. The abuse of oppressors and the cruelty of tyrants, all their whips and cudgels and curses, is gone, done away with, a deliverance as surprising and sudden as Gideon's old victory over Midian. The boots of all those invading troops, along with their shirts soaked with innocent blood, will be piled on a heap and burn, a fire that will burn for days. For a child has been born, for us, the gift of a son, for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His name will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. His ruling authority will grow, and there will be no limits to the wholeness he brings. For he will rule from the historic David throne over that promised kingdom. He'll put that kingdom on a firm footing and keep it going. And with fair dealing and right living, beginning now and lasting always, the zeal of the angel, the angel armies will do the, all this. Let's pray. Wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you for this great privilege that we have to read these words that were written by the prophet Isaiah. We thank you that the prophet Isaiah was inspired by your Holy Spirit to give this oracle, this prophetic word. And we thank you that it spoke into the situation of Israel during that particular time of history and it pointed them towards a time that was to come when you would send your Messiah. And now, Lord, we who have seen in our hearts the birth of the Messiah and we who feel his living presence in the world today, we look forward to the day that he returns. But we also, with great joy, desire to be used by him in our everyday life right here and right now. Allow us, Lord, to understand these things and allow us to live by them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Please take your seats again. What do we see in this text? What, what, what's particularly going on in this story? Without, without going into the history of too much of what's happening, but the situation in the northern part of, of Israel. So when King David established the kingdom, it went well for a little while, and then it was divided into a northern part and a southern part, and they're just getting ready to have their enemies come down on them. They have been bad kings. They have been bad kings. There have been a few good kings, but they are the exception. And what's happening is there's a situation, and this situation is bad and getting worse. There's an interesting phrase in here. This phrase says this. It talks about Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles? Wait a minute. Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus made Capernaum as his hometown, and that was in Galilee. So what's Galilee of the Gentiles? Now, you remember how the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and then they came into the Promised Land, and they were supposed to take over all of this area, and they were supposed to subdue it and establish all of these things. But the reality was, by this time, around 700 AD, uh, B.C., it was very, very clear that the northern part that part all the way from the Sea of Galilee into the area of Galilee and stretching on up into the Mediterranean, it didn't really belong to them. Oh, we had the Assyrians coming down. We had the Phoenicians there. We had all of these people. And what you have is the Israelites, as a kingdom, as a power, don't control the land that they're supposed to control. Their enemies have humbled them over and over and over and over. Our world in the last two or three hundred years has seen the scourge of colonialism. I have, I, have, I have spent most of my life in this part of the world, but I have spent a fair amount of my life in the West. And in the West, I have heard talk from people from my own country, the Americans who had colonial enterprises in the Philippines and in Puerto Rico and in Guam and places like that, try and justify their colonial activities as somehow having been good for the people that they colonized. 
Amazingly, the Americans are not the only ones who try and do that. I have spoken with other people from other countries that I won't mention by name because I don't want any Spanish, Portuguese, or Dutch people to be mad at me. <laughs> I don't mind if the English people are mad at me. But, but the, the, all of the colonial powers felt like they were doing something good for the people that they ruled. I don't know how many of you have seen that, that, that great movie, Gandhi. And in that movie, he, he makes a point about colonialism. And he says, when you are being colonized, you are not master in your own home. And the colonizer is the master in your house. And it's always bad. This is what was going on in Israel. They had, they had this understanding that God had a special plan and purpose for them. They had a King David who had done amazing things. And yet through their own failures, they didn't even control things. When this prophecy was made, it was bad and it was getting worse. What's the next thing that we see? First of all, the situation is bad and getting worse. The second thing that we see is when things look the worst, God is going to come into the situation. Bad getting worse. The worse it gets, the worse it gets, then God comes into the situation. This is what this prophecy we just read is all about. I, I like what Oswald said, and I have this quote here for you. It says this, when every human attempt to bring light has failed, then God will bring light, not because he must, not because human craft has discovered the key to force him, but merely out of his own grace. It is part of that grace that the source of light will be in the very part of the land which first felt the lash of Assyria, the area around the Sea of Galilee. So God never permits a humiliation for which there is not a corresponding exaltation planned. It was that area around Galilee where they lost control, where their enemies poured through to dominate them, where it became a crossroad of people from all different kinds in all different places. They were humiliated in that area. You know, I've always wondered. I, I never thought of it until I prepared this message. And, and maybe I'm wrong. Why did Jesus go to Galilee? He's from the tribe of David. Bethlehem is where he was born. That's where his family would be. Why Galilee? Well, the suggestion here is it's in Galilee where God's people were the most humiliated. And so God goes into, sends his light into Galilee. And then the third thing that we see is that God's Messiah, who's prophesied in this passage, who was born 2,000 years ago, who's coming back at some point, and who lives and reigns in the midst of us, who establishes his kingdom, is going to be a ruler like no other ruler in history. What's the description? This is very interesting. What's the description? First of all, the promise is, for a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us, a child. Now, if you study the history of the world, you'll find that there are many times in different kingdoms or different established places where, where uh, all kind of authority was passed down from uh, along a family lineage where there was a child who was set up as a king or queen. And you know what almost always happens when a child is set up as a king or queen? Some adult says, I'll help them, I'll watch over them, and the adult steals everything. It steals the power, steals the authority. I mentioned last Sunday, you know, my, my, the Scottish part of my family are stewards. And a steward, the word steward, the name steward comes from steward. And a steward was set up to take care of the Scottish king, and he figured out a way to let him become the king. Because the idea of a child being the king is not normal in history. It's not normally a good thing. But the Messiah that God is going to send is a child. He is a gift. And he's going to take over the running of the entire world. So what we have is there's a really bad situation in the northern part of Galilee and into Egypt. And God says, don't worry. The time is coming when my solution is not only for that place. My solution is for the whole world. His ruling authority will grow, and there will be no limits to the wholeness he brings. Unlimited, unlimited wholeness. Think of that. That sounds like a good slogan for some kind of a health thing. Doesn't it sound like that? You know, you go to a spa for unlimited wholeness or something like that. I skipped over some things. His name are going to be Amazing Counselor. 
Have you ever been to a counselor who wasn't any good? Yeah. When, I, when, I was, when I was pastoring a really small church, I mean a really, really small church, yeah, I started off with nine adults and seven of them moved. So I went to see a guy who was an expert in children's ministry. And I said, I've got to do something in my little church to be able to promote more kids because there were no kids. He said, let me tell you what I did in my last church. I hired a helicopter and I gave free helicopter rides to anybody who would bring their friends to church. That was like totally worthless advice. Do you know what, how much it cost to hire a helicopter? I was making $50 a week. I would have gone in the hole for a whole year to hire a helicopter for an hour, you know. I mean, that's useless. No, this Messiah is a wonderful counselor. This Messiah is a strong God. This Messiah is an eternal father. This Messiah is the prince of wholeness. He's going to rule from the historic David throne over that promised kingdom. Uh, The way to phrase this or to think about it, it's kind of like back to the future, but instead it's forward to the future. Looking back, we see the David kingdom, which was the greatest kingdom Israel ever had, and that is going to be restored, but it's going to be restored in a future tense, and it's going to be great. He'll put the kingdom on a firm footing, and we'll keep it going with fair dealing and right living, beginning now and lasting always. God sends an answer that's the perfect answer. You know how frustrated the Israelites have been? They've tried to be loyal. They've tried to obey their king. So they've had one king after another, and the king goes this way wrong, and that way wrong, and that way wrong, and that way wrong. The Lord promises them they'll have a king who will never fail them. Why? Because the zeal of the God of the angel armies will do this. Can I, can I make a confession? There's a word that's used in many of the scripture translations, and that, that is called the Lord of hosts. And I really like the way that sounds, but I, I didn't really understood, understand what it meant. It sounds very impressive, Lord of hosts. And then I discovered that it's really a reference to a God or Lord who commands all of the heavenly angel armies. And actually, in the, uh, Eugene Peterson, in this translation, he calls it God of the angel armies. That just doesn't sound as good to me as Lord of hosts. But anyway, that's a better definition. The important thing that you need to understand, it's God who makes this all happen. You see, things are bad. Things are really bad. Things are bad and getting worse. But God, when things look so bad that nothing else can get any worse, God steps in and he turns around and he does all of this amazing stuff and he does it by his strength a ruler, a Messiah, like has never before existed in history. What did this mean when Jesus came 2,000 years ago? What did they understand the promise of the Messiah to be? What was the average Jewish person who read the promises of Isaiah, what were they thinking? The first thing they needed to understand was that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. This passage of scripture is telling them, they will understand this as having said, no matter how bad you think think it is, I'm going to have an answer for that. I will always keep my promise. What, What was it like for them at that period of time? It was a terrible time if you were a person who believed that your people were God's chosen people. You were a descendant of Abraham. Abraham walked with God. You were a descendant of a group of people that Moses called out of Egypt, and you made it through the promised land. You conquered a whole land, and you should be a great people. One of your kings was this great King David who conquered all this land, killed a a giant, did all these things. And then Solomon, his son, created this strong political economic empire. But the reality of their lives 2,000 years ago was nothing like that. The reality of their lives was that they were under the boot of the Romans. You remember the, the, the thing that it says in one passage in the, in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, if somebody orders you to carry things one mile, you should take them two miles. You, you know what that's a reference to? The reference is that if there was a Roman soldier and he had a bag and he walked up to you and said, take my bag and follow me, you had to follow him. Can you imagine? 
This is your own country. Your own country. You're there in your own country. And if a guy in a Roman little toga comes up and says, pick up my stuff and follow me, you had to do it. Of course, Jesus' answer was pretty clever. Jesus said, yeah, they can force you to walk a mile, but go ahead and walk two miles. Then you're in control of the situation. Interesting thought. These were people who had this great and wonderful history, and it wasn't working out. Things had been bad during the times of the northern kingdom. They were worse now. At least in those days, there was a king in Jerusalem. There's a king now, and he's not really Jewish. The king of the Jews is not even a king, not even Jewish. They had some terrible things that had happened even before the Romans. Under the Seleucids, there had been a, there had been a ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. He named himself a gift of God, Epiphanes. And when he went into Jerusalem, he set up idol worship in the temple, and he sacrificed unclean animals in the temple of the living God. Now, the Maccabees did raise up and chase them out, but it didn't last very long. And then the Romans came on his stead. All of this stuff is unfolding. They are at the lowest of the low. And yet God said to them, I know it's bad, and it might get worse, but I will keep my promise, and I will send the Messiah. Secondly, what does it mean in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back? When you and I read this prophecy 2,000 years ago, the shepherds and the rulers and the wise men and all those other people, they would have read it and understood it. What does it mean in the light to you and I today in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back? No matter how bad things are around us, things have been this bad before. If you want to start a conversation, you're sitting around with a group of people, you're drinking coffee, say, man, I never thought these things would get this bad in, and then just mention a country, and you'll be accurate. Yeah, No matter what you talk about, it's bad everywhere. You know, The economy's bad, the politics bad, the politics are bad. We, well, I, I better be careful. So. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm talking about? Doesn't it seem like the world has lost its way? No matter how bad it is for us to think about it, no matter how bad it might get in a while, it's been bad before. But no matter what we see around us in the future, we do not need to be afraid because God has an answer. And in the end of it, there will be victory. Just like, just like when this prophecy was given by Isaiah, those people could see that their enemies were eating them alive. And Isaiah said, don't worry, God's in control. You and I, as we look at the world around us, God is in control. Does it mean that things won't get difficult? No, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that God will do what we want him to do? No, it doesn't mean that. But God is the one who is in control. All right, finally down to you and me. We know what it meant 2,000 years ago when they were waiting for Jesus to be born. We know what it will mean on the day when he comes back. What does it mean to you and I today? What does it mean to each of us here? Number one, you may be in darkness, just like Israel was in darkness. You may be in darkness because of your own circumstances, the things that are happening all around you, not something that you have done, but just the circumstances of life and your family, circumstances of your birth, circumstances of your business, but when you're in darkness because of your own circumstances, you need to turn to Jesus. You may be in darkness because of your own mistakes and fears. That's really hard. It's really hard when you're in darkness because other people, have, things have gone wrong and other things like that, and that's really hard. But it's, I think, even harder when you recognize you've done something wrong. You've messed up in your family You've messed up in your business. You made the wrong decision. You've made the big mistake. And if you're in darkness because of your own mistakes and fears, turn to Jesus because he is the answer. If you're in darkness because of attack from others, people are against you. People are plotting against you. People don't like you. People are trying to do things. Turn to Jesus. Let Jesus shine 
in your life. You know, there's a saying in English, it's always darkest before the dawn. I got a new saying for you. When dawn comes, when the day spring comes, the darkness flees away. The message for us this evening is that Jesus has been promised to us as a day spring, like a sun rising in a certain place on the horizon, and when the sun is risen, the darkness flees. Three take-homes for you today. Number one, God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. Number two, God has an answer, and the answer has a name, and his name is Jesus. And number three, let Jesus shine, the light of Jesus, shine in your life no matter what's going on in your life.